Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting virtual tour with the Foss Waterway Seaport and, of course, myself, Chris, with Pretty Gritty Tours. Tonight's adventure is brought to you by Tacoma Creates, the Port of Tacoma, and, of course, Columbia Bank. And we are exploring tonight a topic that I can't believe we haven't already covered like eight times, but it is the Foss Waterway itself. You know, it's the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum. And for years now, we've been doing virtual tours of maritime history and heritage in the area. But we've never actually really dove in to the seaport itself. And so we're we're doing a joint project. We're going to be doing live kayak tours of the seaport, um, of the waterway. But we're also going to be doing this one today. So in case you don't want to go kayaking or you're just interested about it from the comfort of your own home, this is your opportunity to learn something about it. And what an what an incredible and pivotal topic it is. So join me tonight, and uh, it's very nice to see all of you, might I just say. But join me tonight as we get to explore this iconic piece of the Tacoma waterfront that has been so influential to the Port of Tacoma and the City of Destiny for, for ages, for decades now. So let's let's take a look into it. We'll just jive right in. But if you're not familiar, it's this stretch of water that obviously extends right in front of the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum. Uh, these are some shots that I took from my various trips on a kayak or stand-up paddleboard down through the area here. And it's also <laughs> the place where I've seen perhaps one of the most Tacoma things I've ever witnessed, which is somebody sunbathing right by the fuel processing plant down there on the little strip of beach in the industrial port. And I freaking love it. <laughs> so here's one of the historic shots. This is about as far back as the photography goes from this. And I'll see if I can make this one a little bit bigger for you. Uh, but this is from the 1880s, and you can see the outline silhouette of Mount Rainier out there, and then early Tacoma waterfront after this area started getting developed by people coming out here for the railroad. Now, of course, this is the ancestral land of the Puyallup people, but as urbanization started to take over, the Foss Waterway became really important to the city of Tacoma for shipping and industrial port activities. <clears throat> Here you can see this is from, ooh, I think the 1880s. I'm trying to remember the exact date on this one. But the waterway was originally called the City Waterway, and it was created through dredging in 1902. And the waterway had already existed prior to that time. It was a little inlet. Uh, coming off of Commencement Bay. And what's interesting is most people, I think, assume that it was part of a river system or something, but it really was just a little inlet into the area there that didn't have uh, a headwater feeding into it, except for one part, which is now the Wheeler Osgood Waterway. We'll look at that in a second. But it really was just this, this naturally occurring inlet. And then in 1902, the Army Corps of Engineers went in under direction of the city and they dredged this thing specifically to make it wider. It was already pretty deep and incredibly long, extending all the way into where the heart of the city was. And of course, very importantly, the railroad. But what they needed to do was make it wide enough that tall ships from the time could pivot, that they could come in you know, unload cargo, reload cargo, and then swing all the way around. And they always caught the prevailing wind so that they could just catch it in their, their foresails and then out into the commencement bay and away they went. And so it was really the width that became important to this. So in 1902, they made it 500 feet wide. And again, that was really just to accommodate the, the wheat ships at the time. And it didn't get the name Foss Waterway until 19. 89, exactly 100 years after the arrival of Taya Foss and her husband Andrew, who of course together founded the Foss Maritime Company, the single most important tugboat company in the area, hands down, and you know their history is iconic to the Tacoma area. <laughs> uh, during the 20th century, you know you really get to see 
people inject new life into the waterway. And it is, in case you didn't know, but I feel like we've talked about it a lot, the Superfund cleanup site for this area here. There was such industrial pollution in the waterway over the years of its activity as an, a port inlet that by the 90s, something absolutely had to be done. And if you haven't seen the city of Tacoma's incredible documentary on the Superfund cleanup and re-injecting new life into the waterway, 100% check it out. But that rebranding of calling it the Foss Waterway for the first time instead of the city waterway was part of that huge mission to make the downtown waterfront enjoyable, livable, and someplace that people actually wanted to go. But here you can see it when it was really at its peak of industrial city waterway. And this is, well, of course, what it looks like now. So that cleanup was accomplished in 94, 1994, and the city of Tacoma volunteered to take the lead in developing that clean uh, path forward there. And then here's a chart so you can see a little bit what we're talking about here. On the left, obviously, that's the, the Foss Waterway Seaport. And that little spur, that branch on the right, that's the Wheeler Osgood Waterway. It was originally part of the Puyallup River, and that was severed by the Army Corps of Engineers at the same time that they were accomplishing that dredging to create it a uh, 500-foot wide waterway there. Here you can actually see a map level of it. And again, that one right there, that's the Wheeler Osgood Waterway. And then this whole thing here is the Foss Waterway. This is an inlet today, but not historically. There are massive, very wide around city drainage, um, stormwater drainage pipes that feed into the waterway today. But historically, there's never been a river or anything that poured into this. <clears throat> like I said, it gets its name from Taya Foss and her, Andrew, and her husband, Andrew. This is their original boathouse, which was right down there on the waterfront, originally at 400 Dock Street. So in really a um, little bit farther south, kind of closer to where the 11th Street Bridge is, but the same sort of idea as where the Foss Waterway Seaport is today. And here's one that you can kind of get a better look for in the background on the right here, this one. That's, of course, the Tacoma Hotel, which burned down in the 1930s and is on the foundation of what is now that uh, warehouser office building. I was blanking on it for a second there. The, the warehouser office building obviously doesn't have the warehousers inside of it anymore. They keep moving farther north from their original headquarters here in Tacoma. But this is that location where it would have been. And then right here, you can see the houseboat. And what's Great about a houseboat is, of course, you can move it when you need to. So the Foss family didn't stay in one location. They had their operation there at 400 Dock Street. But as the waterfront expanded and Tacoma blew up into this amazing city, they were able to just unmoor it and shoop, take it away, which is how it at one point ends up in the Wheeler Osgood waterway located right here. And man, that place has got some wild history. Spoiler alert, it's all fire. <laughs> um, if you are looking for it, it's right here. Circled it for you for a second. <laughs> One of the biggest developments that the Foss family made was when they created this structure right here. This is an old seaplane hangar that they purchased out of Seattle and floated down here with their tugboats. And so the bottom level became a tugboat repair shop. And then the upper level was their home and offices because the Foss family for a very long time lived in the houseboat where they did business. Eventually when they moved into Tacoma, a lot of their employees got to occupy that upper level there. So this is from 1944, uh, representing the offices of Foss Launch and Tug. And right in the middle of the waterways where this would have been located at the time. Now, if you have ever experienced the Foss Waterway or gone down there on a paddleboard, a kayak, or just walking around, there's probably some things that you've noticed and been curious about. And it's my job tonight to answer those questions. So feel free to comment as well. Uh, I'll do my best to answer those questions in real time, at least type out an answer for you guys while we're going along here. But one of the things I always get asked about is what is that 
flame, <laughs> right? If you've ever seen the waterfront at night in particular, you've probably seen the like eternal torch across that way. That is the Phillips 66 fuel facility. And what that is, is a venting flare uh, to stabilize or release pressure. Sometimes the best option is to release some of that pressure and then ignite it so that you're not just spewing fuel out into the whatever, the atmosphere, the world, the waterway. And so that's a venting flare, which is regulating the pressure over there on Phillips 66. And that's a good thing that they're right next door to, of course, the historic fire station. So of all of Tacoma's historic fire stations, quite a few of them are original from the early 1900s. This particular one is built was built in 1928. And it got put on the historic register in 1986, right about the same time that there was a revitalization of the sea, seaport down here and sort of creating a new waterway. And of course, this one is particularly significant because it's the only historic firehouse that I know of, at least, that's down on the water specifically. And its job was to make sure that the waterfront didn't just combust at any given point. And especially when we talk about the businesses that were down in the Wheeler Osgood section there, you'll understand why that became so important. And we've done all sorts of virtual tours on just the flammability of the waterfront, I think. Uh, in particular, the, the Great Flower Fire back in the early days of this was, was the only time that this prime watercraft that they had for fighting fires was out of the water for maintenance. If you're curious, you can still go see the historic fireboat down on Ruston Way. It's curated now as a display item down there. But the only time that they had taken it out of the water for maintenance just happened to be the time that the flower um, storage facility down on the waterfront caught fire and was destroyed in this miraculous blaze and emoliation. Today, of course, we have the significantly safer facility, the grain warehouses and silos down there. Uh, that are, you've probably seen them constantly loading up ships down there and then sending that grain out around the world. But this is still an active firehouse. Though it was built in 1928, it still maintains its presence down there. And of course, there's the several fireboats that you've seen docked down there on the waterfront. Here it is in its prime. And then of course, the, the Tacoma fireboat down there with its hoses at the ready. The other thing that people have, often ask me about is what this building is. Uh, that's a very intentionally placed series of dead trees in front. Using deadfalls like this is a great way to create natural habitat for a lot of the creatures in the area, particularly birds. And this is the Center for Urban Waters, which is an environmental um, protection guardianship company that works on environmental sciences, um, analysis, and then works with engineers and policymakers to develop and create sustainable solutions for restoring, protecting, and developing Puget Sound. In particular, of course, Commencement Bay and places like the Foss Waterway. And they've been around for a while, just dedicating themselves to making everything better in the area. Now, <laughs> Going a little bit farther down past the, the fire station, past the 11th Street Bridge, I want to point out some stuff in the Wheeler Osgood waterway there. Uh, today, occupying one of the historic structures is a company here called Urban Accessories. They're, they're kind of right back here. They, you know, what I think is interesting about the Foss waterway today is that it still maintains its past by being a place where a lot of industrial production and development still happens down there. Historically, the Foss Waterway would be significant for timber, shipbuilding, um, industrial production, railroad, things like that. And it maintains almost all of those still down there today, including the timber industry, believe it or not. However, it has advanced, it's evolved into something new as well. So you see a lot more um, environmental protection companies down there, a lot more environmental stewardship. You'll see a lot more youth programs down there, certainly more than you would have ever seen when it was just industrial port down there. <laughs> but um, this is a good example of sort of one foot in the past, eyes looking forward. 
urban accessories develops aesthetically pleasing industrial items for an urban landscape. And I think for me, one of my favorite things that I couldn't help but talk about just because they caught my eye are these are their manhole covers and they're freaking gorgeous. I think they do such a good job of repurposing materials into something like this where it serves this very blue collar industrial everyday use, but they goosed it up a little bit so that it's very attractive. The Wheeler Osgood Waterway, though, gets its name from the fact that it used to host the Wheeler Osgood Timber Company. So here's a picture from 1927 of the Wheeler Osgood plant. Um, they did wood production of various degrees. And it was opened all the way back in 1889 by, of course, Mr. George Osgood and W.C. Wheeler. Uh, D.D. Clark was in there as well, but for whatever reason, he doesn't get his name on the big board or the waterway today. But it was a millworking plant. So 1927, I guess that would have been, what, their 37th year of operation. And it was the, at the time, the largest door factory in the world. They were really uh, opening doors for timber production in the area. I'm so sorry. I'll try not to do that too much tonight. Uh, but they were they were a one-stop shop. So because Tacoma was so central to the timber industry, obviously the warehousers were in the area, they could do everything here. So they would receive the timber in the waterway, then they would mill it down, saw it, and produce it into whatever they needed to. So you could bring them raw timber, trees freshly felled, and they could create whatever it was, doors, furniture, anything from there on out. But being a timber production and milling company comes with its own hazards. Uh, here's a picture of it a little bit closer down on the waterfront there. And here you can see its facility. I think you can even notice their towers there down here on the waterfront. And you can see it's little, uh, the waterway itself there. Over here is the 11th Street Bridge. And then the additional bridges that used to bridge over the Foss Waterway are over here. And this is from the 1959 fire that eventually destroyed the abandoned Wheeler Osgood Company mill at that point. And when I was looking into it, I was just trying to verify some information for everything. Uh, I was like, okay, so when was the fire? And... <laughs> When wasn't the fire is a better question. Wheeler Osgood caught fire all the time. It was like their hobby or something. They produced incredible furniture, all sorts of sweet doors, and they caught themselves ablaze all the time. Because the first one I found was in 1902. They caught fire, almost destroyed everything. Then here they are in 1915 with the second well-publicized Wheeler Osgood fire. Um, which the fire department just down the road luckily was able to respond to in time. Also, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see this. Going through historic news articles is one of my favorite things. This one, complete non sequitur. Um, <clears throat> where is the My William Garrity had been calling the police <laughs> and got a judge to subpoena his own daughters. William Garrity got a judge to subpoena his own daughters so that they could testify against Patrick Hogan for flirting. Uh, Garrity was the fourth guy to get arrested for flirting with the Garrity girls. And I have not been able to find more about that story, but rest assured, my heart will not be at peace until I can tell you guys why the Garrity girls were so well protected by their father from flirting and how that is an arrestable offense in 1915. But it was. Well, <laughs> um, Patrick Hogan apparently wasn't the only thing ablaze. So was the Wheeler Osgood facility again in 1921. This time, just a casual $500 loss in the blaze at the Wheeler Osgood facility. But guess what? A few years later in 1935, $50,000 were lost in the mill fire. And it took 100 firemen working with the, the Wheeler Osgood facility to come out and put down this blaze. And it wasn't alone. There's another one article here. This time, the fire destroyed not just the lumber sheds, but three horses were consumed in the blaze. And it took thousands of gallons of water a minute to finally put this out. 
they just could not help but catch fire. And when you look at the facility, you can see why one of the big things that they were tasked with was the disposal of slag timber or sawdust. And so to get rid of it, they would burn it. And I don't know if you can see it in the photograph here, but these smokestacks, these are a type of beehive burner. What you do is you burn your slag timber inside them, and it's got a grate on top that is supposed to prevent your city from catching fire. Was that infallible? Absolutely not. A lot of this place caught on fire, not significantly like Seattle, but it was a problem. And so these, these burners were a common sight down here in the port in the early days of Tacoma. And in fact, when you're on the Foss Waterway today, you'll see an homage to that. The hot shop for the Tacoma Glass Museum is an homage to the, the beehive burners, the bee stack burners of the olden days. And you can see it's got very much a similar design to it. I'll flip back there. But it's got that, that grate on top and then sort of the flared bottom there. That's exactly what you're looking for with the hot shop there. So if you've ever wondered why they chose that sort of aesthetically pleasing cone, it is like the rest of the seaport and the, the waterway here. One foot honoring the past, the other firmly planted in the future. Which actually, the other one right there. So on the left, where you see the Albert Mills Brothers lofts, that's the same thing. Those are now really high-end lofts down there on the waterfront, classing up the whole place. But they used to look like this. The Albert Brothers Mill was constructed in 1905, and it was an anchor for the, the milling and grist production of the area. Albert Brothers were first down in Portland, Oregon, but had quite a few facilities throughout the area. And of course, Tacoma was a no-brainer because of its deep port and all of the massive amounts of shipping that were going there and its connection to the railroad, it made sense. And you can see they actually had their own little spur line come right up to the back of the mill down there. Here's a fantastic uh, picture showing the Portland, Seattle, and Tacoma uh, mills with Mr. Albert himself up top there. This is what the, the Albert Brothers Milling Company looks like today. And this is very much the forward-looking side of the Foss Waterway. I think I always tell people you get a snapshot of past and present when you're on the waterway. When you're looking backwards, you see the 11th Street Bridge, a lot of, you know, industrial port of Tacoma, as well as like the venting flare from Philip 66. But when you look the other direction, it's this idyllic picture of Mount Rainier, the 21st Street Cable Bridge, the Tacoma Dome, the lofts. It's this like, ah, we can turn this into an accessible piece of waterfront. And one of the things that I think is so interesting is that back when it was the city waterway, it wasn't Foss Waterway yet. It was just industrial port. It was like you didn't go there. It was the Skid Row side of town, just where things worked and were developed and the pollution was terrible. And then very similar to Spokane's riverfront area, they took the least desirable part of town and developed it into one of the iconic parts of the area. Now, while the Foss Waterway hasn't gone as far as Riverfront Park, probably because we didn't have a World's Fair hosted there, it has come leaps and bounds, miles ahead of where it was in the 1980s and certainly before that. One of the iconic historic structures that you can see from the waterway, but often people don't, is this one right here. I think a lot of people have questions about this one as well. That is the Junior Line Furniture Company, which this picture here shows it in 1942. And one of the things that made it so significant isn't just that it was one of the largest furniture production facilities on the West Coast, but from the 1940s onward, they ran with an all-woman crew. I believe that became uh, something that was just a wartime necessity, that they brought in all these women as the men were deployed overseas and the women started developing furniture. But they continued like that up through, I think, the mid-1950s with basically an all-woman crew trained on production of furniture in that area. 
that was eventually abandoned. Uh, but by 1956, it was still very much going strong. And then you see it as it is today, right down there. One of the other big changes that I want to note is the fact that the Foss uh, waterway had so many bridges and way later in the game than people expect. You go down today and you see the 21st Street Bridge and the 11th Street Bridge, the Murray Morgan Bridge, but there were three others at one point, and you get to see them here. This picture is from 1958 of the waterway. I'll get you in a little bit closer here. And... This is looking northwards up towards Point Defiance. And like I said, 1958, this was taken. It shows the 11th Street Bridge, the railroad bridge at 15th, and then the railroad bridge a little bit farther down. And one of the iconic pieces here that I think a lot of people will recognize is the Schoenfeld's uh, Furniture Building. Now, I feel like a lot of people that came of age in Tacoma really knew that place, especially in like the 50s and 60s. That's one that was so large and so iconic for the area. What I think is wild about this is that you can see, first of all, this one right here, the 15th Street train bridge, this provided access to downtown for the trains. You know, the, the Prairie Line Spur Trail, which of course goes up through the UW Tacoma campus, that had access coming over the waterfront here like this. And then the bridge beneath it was designed to allow people access from downtown Tacoma into the port itself. And so you had this way to get in to the tide flats at a time when they were really inaccessible. And you think about the fact that the 21st Street Bridge and its direct access to Northeast Tacoma and the port wasn't there yet. Uh, the 11th Street Bridge is a lift bridge, so there are times where it becomes difficult to access the port. This was a really good alternative to that. And I think, let me see if I can make it a little bigger for you. You're able to see it here. These parts that run the length of the waterfront here, those are ballast and then the cradle, essentially, that this bridge pivots on. So the 15th... 15th Street Railroad Bridge and the bridge down here, both of these turn. Unlike the 11th Street Bridge up here, which is a lift bridge, these ones pivot on their center post here and so end up sitting on that, that float there and then ships can go in and out either side. And they did. Here's where they are twisted so that you can see that the ships can go on either side of it there highlighted just in case you have any questions but of course the most iconic bridge in the area at least in my opinion for the waterway we're, we're taking the narrows out of the competition here really quick is the 11th street bridge or the murray morgan morgan bit bridge this is from 1979 and it was dedicated in 1913 and it was very expensive at the time it was six hundred thousand dollars to create this steel truss lift span bridge. And its whole purpose was to provide that link between downtown and port, which is why today on these massive concrete uh, counterweights here, you see Port of Tacoma on one side and then on the other side it says City of Tacoma. So that you know which way you're going. <laughs> but it was named for Murray Morgan, who is I think one of the most famous Northwest historians in the area. Uh, certainly by the 90s, again, when this was all getting a revitalization and a facelift, Murray Morgan was the face of history in Tacoma. But he also worked on the bridge. He was one of the first um, tenders of this particular lift bridge. So it was an easy, easy reach to name him for this. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger for the air. And it's... It's not just iconic, but it's really remarkable. Um, they were considering a swing bridge, but they decided they were going to go for the lift bridge on this one. And you can see massive military ships could get underneath it, which is a great thing because there were so many shipyards in the waterway. Here, you actually get to see one of the Foss tugs bringing in this particular ship right here. Uh, I'm trying to remember what this one is. If I'm not mistaken, this is the USS Lafay. Well, you can tell me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. I probably am. 
But uh, this was on display down here at the Tacoma Municipal Dock after being hit by five Japanese kamikaze planes and four bombs uh, just off of Okinawa. And the crew suffered 103 casualties um, with 32 dead and 71 wounded during that attack. And so they had to bring this destroyer back where it was um, repaired. And so they had it down there on display. I think this is from 1946. Or no, this was would have been before. Uh, in 1946, she was actually part of the um, atomic bomb tests. So here's one of the classic shots of the Murray Morgan Bridge. I love that it always frames Mount Rainier. And if you've been in Firefighters Park anytime in the last couple of years, you get to see that iconic piece of art that they've got installed down there, the red one now, that helps frame that a little bit better. But this was um, sort of in disrepair out a while for a while there. And so um, they went through a tremendous amount of rehabilitation and historic preservation to get it back to its original zone. And if you go underneath it today, you'll get to see some of the pieces of their original bridge that they replaced, but they've now displayed down there, along with one of my uh, absolute favorite murals. It's this bright sort of electric gold one down there that highlights Tea Fas. Uh, the Puyallup tribe, and iconically, Jack the Bear. Which if you don't know the Jack the Bear story, it's great. He was a local black bear who stumbled into the care of the Tacoma Hotel, where they took care of him. Uh, he ended up learning how to drink beer, so he could drink beer out of a little stein there at the hotel bar. And he was much beloved in the community. Uh, until, of course, a rookie cop mistook him for a wild bear, shot him, and then the police department had a barbecue with him. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's a 1921 photograph showing you sort of the length and breadth of the uh, city waterway, later the Foss Waterway down there. And it's got one of the, the ferries down there. This is the steamship Indianapolis at the Tacoma Terminal. And I think it's a perfect lead in because if you go down to the waterfront today, you will see another iconic ferry, but it's not what you expect. This is the Annabelle. The Annabelle started in 1938 on the Dalles by the, on the Columbia River and ran from 1938 to 1955 um, when they built the bridge. And she was no longer necessary as a ferry to get across the Columbia River. And at the time, this is what she looked like. This is the original Annabelle ferry. It went across, again, right where the Dalles is on the Columbia River and has been converted into a spacious liveaboard ferry. So it's docked down there in Tacoma, but I believe it was in 1960, she moved to uh, Heron Island, where she uh, still operated for a while. But in 94, um, these two individuals, Dennis and Kat, purchased her and converted her from this into this. So by adding the additional stories and some different steerage and obviously a few more amenities, they turned the Annabelle into this liveaboard ferry. Last I heard, I haven't checked recently, but the Annabelle is still for sale. So if you're looking for a spacious liveaboard aquatic home, waterfront property, wherever you are, uh, that is still available, unless I'm mistaken. But, but at a time of publishing, that was true. And that's right underneath essentially where the 11th Street Bridge is next to the historic firehouse down there. One of the things that I can't state enough, though, is that the Foss Waterway is there for timber, right? So Tacoma being a timber town, um, all this milling and production, like the Wheeler Osgood, was done down there on the waterfront, and they could bring logs in there. So this is of the middle waterway, pictured right here, but just down the way, the Foss Waterway often had a whole series of log floats, log rafts being brought in and out, and then, of course, milled down down there. And this was, let's see, I'm trying to think, 1937? And in 1937, Washington, Tacoma in particular, was already the third largest pulp producing region in the country. And it was just because we had such an abundance of uh, hemlock in the area. Hemlock was really good for pulp production. So they could fell it, put it on a train or a truck, 
bring it down here uh, or just dump it in the water wherever it was and then bring it by barge up to the waterway here where it could get milled down again at facilities not dissimilar to this one and then a lot of it also got milled into boats boats and ships so we had a whole series of shipwrights and ship production facilities out here in Tacoma the the Todd facility was maybe the most prolific, certainly most famous for a long time because they were making wooden ships and cargo ships for World War II. One of the things that made the wooden boat building industry so significant, especially during World War II, is that they could be used for mine sweeping vessels. Mines, aquatic mines were magnetic. And so to prevent them from sticking and then exploding, if you made a wooden hold boat, you gr drastically reduced your your chances of exploding out in the ocean. So these minesweepers became really pivotal to the war effort, and a lot of them were produced here in Tacoma at facilities like this one featured right here. And what I think I love the most about this photograph isn't just that you see the production facility with the sh ships and the boats down here. You can see the head of the waterway right down there. But also, you can see the old railroad turntable right here with a steam train there. Now, if you go down to the Foss Waterway today, you'll still see this track that runs right along here. That's still basically there. Uh, BNSF runs the tracks down there. They still have their trains continuously going on the old historic line right along the seaport, right along the Foss Waterway, just the way they always have. And when you look at the map, right, so here's the end of the waterway right here. Here's the historic track located right at the end of it. And then you can still see the old uh, turntable, much different, but still here. So again, I'll show you the historic one really quick. There's that turntable where they can turn the engine. Uh, and there it is located today. So cool. I love when you look at Tacoma and you get to see how much has changed and then also how little has changed. Like this is a great one to show just how much. Like we still have all of these fuel production facilities here. All of the shipyards are still located right here. The historic firehouse is right there. Uh, but the uh, the 15th Street Railroad Bridge and then of course the, the Port Access Bridge is gone today replaced now by the 21st Street Bridge, which is located right about here approximately. Now, when you're looking at things that are still around and have been for ages, this shipbuilding facility is still down there. And you can see the, the areas where they would launch the recently constructed ship. This one is from 1975 and shows ships under construction at what would be the J.M. Martinac facility at the time. And the Martinac Shipbuilding Corps was adjoining to the city. So this is just across the waterfront where, you know, I think what well, would be across from here, Albert Mills approximately. And so you can see there, there are two shipbuilding facilities right here. Here's another one from 1967. So just before the color photography became really important. And you can see the Martinac um, signage here on the front of the ship. So this is a 154 foot tuna boat that was the fifth tuna signer built for a guy named Lou Brito of San Diego. And he had already developed a very close re working relationship with Joe Martinak, who of course ran the Martinak shipbuilding facility out here. And Martinak was the largest, not the facility, but this one right here, the JM Martinak. This was the largest uh, tuna signer built, I think, on the West Coast. I could be mistaken about that, but I'm pretty confident that's true. And when you're down there today, this whole facility is here. So you can see right up here, that's where Urban Accessories is. Today, we still have a lumber facility down here on the waterfront. This is Sound Lumber. And then right over here are the old Martinac shipbuilding facilities down here. And there's still shipbuilding going on down on the waterfront in this area. Uh, Tacoma boat builders are down there. Here's a 1941 photograph of a barge. This is 110 foot, 34 foot wide 
steel barge that had been constructed down there on the waterfront in that same area. And you can see uh, Union Pacific was still the railroad at the time. Just wild to look at it. This would have been one of the wooden boats. This is inside the facility there. So you can see the Martinac production facility from the inside. Here's another good one of them. You can see they're inside the ship as they're building it here. It's just wild to watch them uh, go through it here. I think this is one of the minesweepers. This is a 171 foot wooden minesweeper built on contract for the US Navy. And here's their facility. You can see how um, a little bit farther down is just sandwiched in between those two bridges. And so of course, to get the ships in and out, you had to pivot the, the railroad bridges so that people could get out of there. See if I've got another good one for you. Yeah, this is a little bit farther down. This isn't of the Martinet company. This is of the ship Seattle of the Tacoma Oriental line. And that's docked next to Associated Oil Company, which is, of course, the location where um, Philip 66 is located today. And then eventually one of the Martinac buildings was destroyed by fire. Unfortunately, this happened in sometime in the early 50s. I'm trying to remember when specifically. I get lost in all the, the Wheeler Osgood fires. Something about that little narrow strip of water is the most flammable because not just Wheeler Osgood facility itself, but the Martinac company, which is also located on a little jetty there, caught fire. So I don't know what it was. If they just had more sparks flying around or more accomplished smokers, but something. People were making it happen. So that's that's kind of a snapshot of the Foss Waterway, which again, I feel like is so adjacent, both geographically and historically to so much of what we talk about, but we've really never taken this time to uh, explore it, right? But here's a good one here. This is in 1975, of course, Richard's photography of the waterway up here. You can see the 11th Street Bridge. And again, the the port access bridge was still around at that point. And then down here, we have the new and improved grain silos, which are still the same ones we have today. And you can see this from its past, back when it was major lumber out there, floating it in and out. And then of course, today. It's a gift to have something as easily accessible as the Foss Waterway in our own city core, right? Like you can hop off your stand-up paddleboard and go to the Museum of Glass, go to the restaurants down there, go to the boba place that I really like. But there's there's just such easy access from all of Tacoma to the water. And to have something like this is remarkable. And to have it be the comeback story that it is, is endearing to me. It has been vital at every point in its story. When it was traditional Puyallup territory and was really occupied by the Puyallup tribe, it was very important to the livelihood of the people that were here. As the city of Tacoma developed, this became an important waterway for the development of industry and naval vessels and national defense. And then we get to see it now redeveloped made safe once more, cleaned up, and then brought back to a little bit closer to an equilibrium where now something like a kayak tour can happen. So please stay tuned. Keep your eyes and ears open. There will be more kayak tours offered in association with the Foss Waterway Seaport and Pretty Gritty Tours, giving you opportunities to get down on the water. And we work very closely with Metro Parks Tacoma, uh, and the, the Foss Marine area down there to help offer that. So let me know what you would like to see, and I'll see what I can do to make it happen. But I appreciate you guys tuning in for this one and getting to explore the Foss Waterway a little bit more. Hopefully you have a, a bit better understanding of those iconic pieces of the waterfront that you see down there. Questions, comments, please let me know. I'm always available to answer whatever nuanced things you have about not just Tacoma, but the Pacific Northwest. And until next time, my friends, I'm your guide, Chris, here with the Foss Waterway Seaport and Pretty Gritty Tours saying thank you and keep on exploring.